come back in this lecture we will have this lecture for about an hour this lecture will be about special devices and also diode circuits last week uh, uh, professor sharma talked about pn junction and other details there are a variety of diodes which are used in all kinds of applications we will look at a few of them now we know that when you reverse bias a pn junction you have a depletion capacitance and this depletion capacit depletion region the width of the depletion region depends on the reverse bias now because of this the capacitance cj which is the junction capacitance of a reverse bias pn junction can be related to the reverse bias voltage by the, the by this equation where cj which is the junction capacitance is cj0 by 1 plus vr by v0 to the power m where cj0 is the value of cj for zero voltage and uh, vr is the reverse voltage v0 is built in voltage m is the grading coefficient typically for a p injection diode will be the order of 0.3 to 0.5 so when vr is equal to 0 you would get the same value now this property of a pn junction is extremely useful there are special diodes by the name varactors where this particular property is made use of now varactors you can think of as voltage variable capacitors where they use this variation of the capacitance as a function of the reverse voltage the only difference is they are optimized for this particular uh, purpose therefore the grading coefficient is made between 3 to 4 so that the capacitance variation is a strong function of the reverse voltage now where do we use this we are all familiar with uh, the fine tuned control in our radio and uh, such devices portable devices and uh, the typically if you take a radio the main capacitance there the variation is from 0 to 70 pf when you change the station you are actually going from somewhere between say about 10 to 70 pf now we all have noticed why this uh, fine tune and when this fine tune came to picture maybe about 20 years ago if you had a radio it was extremely difficult to tune to short wave stations especially at night because the variation the way you could choose a, a station at night was ex, it was extremely difficult to choose and that's why when companies came up with this 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 uh, fine tune in a fine tune what you are essentially doing is you are putting a varactor in parallel to the main gang capacitor and uh, by fine tune what you are doing is you are actually changing the reverse voltage and that can be weighed, weighted very smoothly so you would get variation in sub picofarad which is impossible in the gang capacitor now so varactors find extremely uh, common use so today you would find this in almost uh, not only in radios you would find also in in several function generators and all and because of this variation of the capacitance through voltage you could use this uh, in uh, lots of gadgets and the variation is typically in the sub picofarad range so varactors you would find uh, uh, extremely useful in many electronic application especially in rf kind of applications and uh, being a reverse uh, reverse bias diode you would find that the impedance when you put them in parallel there is not much uh, change I mean it does not affect the other capacitance much now let us look at another special type of uh, PN junction or a diode which is a light emitting diode again today light emitting diode uh, 
is something very, very common. We find it almost everywhere in our mobiles, all kinds of gadgets today we are very familiar. Now, two things I am sure we would have wondered how do we get these different colors and also what is the principle of the, these light emitting diodes. Now, light emitting diodes as the word diode says they are also a p n junction, they are made of p n junction, but these are special they are made of special semiconductors. Now, semiconductors can be classified either as direct band gap semiconductors or indirect band gap semiconductors. Now, this is based on the shape of the band gap as a function of the momentum k. Now, in a direct band gap semiconductor, the conduction band minima and the valence band maxima, they occur at the same momentum. Now, generally we draw the conduction band and the valence band as kind of straight lines, but actually uh, you would find them. So, what, what, we, what we mean is So, in a direct semi, uh, band gap semiconductor, the minima of the conduction band and the maxima of the valence band, they occur at the same momentum, crystal momentum. Now, therefore, what happens is when you in an indirect band gap semiconductor, the minima of the conduction band and the maxima of the valence band, they do not occur at the same values of momentum. Typically to give you an illustration, it would in a indirect band gap semiconductor, so the minima of the conduction band is here and the maxima of the valence band is somewhere else. Now, in uh, direct band gap semiconductors, we know that when you when you forward bias a diode, the carriers are injected, holes injected from the from the p region to the n region. Now, what happens is when uh, these uh, carriers, these minority carriers, they recombine, recombine with the majority carriers on the other side, and when they recombine they release energy. Now, in indirect band gap semiconductors this release energy would be in the form of lattice vibration or uh, this is also called non radiative recombination, but in direct band gap semiconductors a, a, a sizable number of this recombinations result in radiative combina uh, recombination or they would generate photons. Now, so, this is the basic principle of an LED. Now, what I have given here an example some examples of direct band gap semiconductors with their band gaps in electron volt in bracket. Now, most of these direct band gap semiconductors are uh, kind of alloys or, or let us say compounds. Now, gallium arsenide is a very good example it is a binary compound, it is a it has a direct band gap with a band gap of 1.43 and so on. Another popular one is aluminum gallium arsenide, it has both direct and indirect band gap 1.42 to 2.46. It can be varied by changing the mole fraction of aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide. So, this is a ternary compound. You have a material called indium phosphide then you have uh, gallium nitride, indium gallium arsenide and so on. There are several such direct band gap semiconductors. Now, when the recombina radiative recombination takes place, the emitted photon energy would be equal to the difference between the higher energy states E 2 and the lower energy state E 1. Now, 
that can be equated by an equation E is equal to E 2 minus E 1, which will be H f or H c by lambda, where lambda would be the, for the light emission lambda, c is the, the velocity of light. Now, the peak emission wavelength lambda, we can express in a more convenient way in terms of the band gap energy by the equation lambda is equal to 1.24 divided by E g in electron volt. So, we see that just by changing the band gap, we can get different light. So, this is how you get different colors. We know that the visible spectrum is from about 400 nanometers to about 700 nanometer. At 700, we have red, 600 to 700, you have red and uh, you have blue somewhere around 300 to 400. Now, by changing E g, you can get different values. Now, let us take an example of a material like aluminum gallium arsenide. By changing the mole fraction of aluminum arsenide and gallium arsenide, you can get different band caps. We will not go into the details of the technology. Now, this is how you could, so you could choose different materials and you could get different colors. Now, let us talk about another very special device, again a, again a diode called a laser diode. Now, there were days when laser diodes were very costly and they were not seen. Today, it is something very, very, very common. All of us are very familiar with the pointer, which we use for presentation and uh, it costs hardly 50 rupees. And interestingly, it is made of a laser diode, which emits light of about around uh, 500 micro, almost 1 milliwatt, a huge amount of light. Now, what is the difference between a laser diode and a light emitting diode? Both are diodes, both emit light. What is the difference? Now, in the light emission in a light emitting diode is by what is called a spontaneous emission. The reason why they are called spontaneous emission is because the emissions are isotropic. We said that if you forward bias a, a p n junction made of a direct semi, uh, band gap semiconductor, uh, because of recombination, we said there will be photon generation. Now, this can happen all over the device. So, therefore, it is not at one point, it is not focused, it is not uh, coherent and the phase also is quite random. That is why it is called a spontaneous emission. So, in a LED, as you would have noticed in a LED display, you would see that the light is actually emitting from a much larger area, if you look closely. And in most of the LEDs, we would use as a display device and there we want the light to be as dispersive as possible. And uh, all of us are familiar with the standard LED and you would see that the structure is made such a way that uh, light is kind of diffuse. So, there, there the purpose itself is to diffuse the light. Now, there is another way to get uh, photon emission. This is what is called stimulated emission. Now, here what is done is the downward transition, which, which uh, is basically releasing of energy can be stimulated, can be triggered through another photon. Now, if you do this, the emitted photon will also be in, in phase and this is what is called stimulated emission. Now, if stimulated emission has to happen, then you need to satisfy a condition called population inversion whereby what we essentially what we are saying is the number of excited states on the higher energy band has to be much higher than the ground state. Now, this can be the structure, device structure of an LED and a laser diode is very different from this point of view. In an LED, you just have a simple p n junction made of direct band gap semiconductor of the right band gap to get the desired color. Whereas, in a laser diode, you need to do something extra to make sure that you have a huge amount of carriers and also they are kind of confined to a very narrow region, so that you can satisfy population inversion. So, this is done through what is called heterostructure. Now, if you have a simple p n junction which we are familiar with, they are called homo junction, which means they are made of the same material p n n. You can also have what are called hetero junctions, where they are made of dissimilar materials with different band gaps. Now, we will not go into the details of it. So, in a laser diode, you would make a p n junction, it is not a, just a p n junction, it will be a 
P P plus N N plus kind of uh, structure, where you would have different band gaps and the adjoining materials will be of slightly different, but they will be matched. Now, because of this you would have a huge amount of carriers kind of trapped in a very narrow region, because of the band gap difference. And also interestingly, they also would have different refract index, because of which when you forward bias this particular junction, this huge amount of carriers are generated and uh, after a threshold value of current, you have stimulated emission. So, if we look at the characteristic of an LED and also if you look at the characteristic of a laser, they are different. Now, what we have here is the current versus light characteristic of an LED, which is almost linear. If you, if you draw the similar characteristics for a laser diode, the difference would be in a laser diode, in a laser diode you would see that till a, till a particular value of uh, current, which is called the threshold current, the device works like a LED. So, which means it has only spontaneous emission. Once it exceeds a certain amount of threshold, which means number of carriers, it would go into stimulated emission and you get a huge amount of light. Now, the major advantage of uh, a, a, a laser diode, which is generally written as LD is basically coherence. Now, when you talk about coherence, there are two types of coherence. One is called the spatial coherence, whereby what you mean is the light is now confined to an extremely narrow region as opposed to an LED, where we said the light is isotropic. So, it, it kind of uh, emits from all over the place. Here, because of simulated emission, the light is extremely focused. Again, we are very familiar with the with the pointer which we are talking about, but in a pointer you also have a lens inside. You have another type of coherence which is called the temporal coherence. Now, temporal coherence is the word used for the spectral purity of the light. In an LED, if you see even though you see a light as red, if you look at the spectrum the of the light, you would see that in an LED, uh, if, if you plot lambda on the x axis. In an LED, you would see that the, the spectral width is quite large. Now, if you do the same thing in a, in a laser diode, you would see that the laser diode spectrum is extremely sharp, meaning the light emits in an extremely narrow range of lambda. Now, this is what is called temporal coherence. Now, because of this, laser diodes are extensively used in uh, several applications. LEDs are used in uh, applications such as optical links, especially short range optical links. Today, we are familiar with LAN. Most of the LAN applications would use an LED, because LED is a very cheap device and the LED which is used for LAN is not the one which we are familiar with they emit light in the infrared region, but the principle is very similar. Whereas, laser diodes are used in the optical, in optical fiber communication today in our country, optical fibers are used for uh, communication throughout in all kind of telecommunication applications. So, that is the difference between LED and uh, laser diode, which are very similar. Now, let us talk about another type of device, which is a photo detector. Again, photo detector is very similar to let us say a solar cell. The main difference in a photo detector, uh, you would reverse bias, uh, this is again a PN junction, which is you would use in a reverse bias mode. Now, what happens in a reverse bias, when you reverse bias a 
photo, a, a pn junction any radiation temperature or any radiation would affect his reverse bias current. Now, that is the principle of a photo detector. In a photo detector, the uh, junction, the reverse bias junction is exposed to light and uh, the light energy, photon energy would uh, be sufficient to break covalent, bo covalent bonds, which would result in uh, what are called photo current. Now, in a photodiode, when you do not uh, shine any light, you have a current which is called dark current, which is essentially the reverse saturation current as opposed to what is called a photo current, which is a light, which is a current which uh, falls due to light. Now, dark currents are typically extremely small, maybe nanoamps kind of range and photo currents can be, it depends very much on the amount of light you shine. Now, a photo detector can be thought of as a controlled current source. This is because of the reason that you have a reverse bias PN junction, which has very high impedance. Now, because of this, we can model this more appropriately as a current source. Now, there is another very interesting device, which you can form out of an LED and a photo detector which is called an optocoupler. Now, optocoupler is an extremely useful device, where this is nothing but a combination of LED and a photo detector. LED is essentially an electrical to optical converter, whereas a photo detector or a photodiode is an optical to electrical converter. There are situations where you would like to pass signal from one system to another system, but unfortunately, you cannot connect a wire between these two systems, because the ground potential of these two systems may be very high and there can be damages. This is very, very true. If you are trying to take a signal from let us say a big vibra a vibrator or a vibrating equipment, let us say in a mechanical engineering lab and you try to connect that signal to a PC. If you do that directly, your PC will burn immediately. In such a situation, what is done is you would use an optocoupler, where you want to connect take the signal from the, the instrument without directly touching. Now, an LED we know that would give you a light which is proportional to the current flowing through it. So, if you apply a signal, it will give you a light which is proportional to the signal and the photo detector we again know would give you a current which is proportional to the light. So, at the output of the photo detector, you could take it maybe amplify it and you have a signal. And it is an extremely useful device which is used for uh, achieving electrical isolation between two systems. And there are many practical applications where you cannot take signal from one system to another system through a wire. In such systems, you can use optocouplers. And uh, very easy to make an optocoupler in a lab, just you can need to just paste, maybe just tie together an LED and a, and a photo detector and you could do very interesting experiments. Now, when we talk about diode circuit, so we talked about uh, uh, about three types of diodes, special diodes. We talked about varactor diodes, we talked about LEDs, we talked about laser diodes, we also talked about photo detectors and then we talked about an application where you would use both photo detector and an LED and we said it is an optocoupler. Now, diodes we are all familiar with the most popular and the most common use of a diode is it is used as a, a, a as a rectifying device and uh, we are familiar with both half a rectifier and uh, full way rectifying uh, applications. Uh, we will spend a little bit time on wave shaping circuits, which is another very major application of diodes. Now, very often you, you can think of a scenario that you have a sine wave signal and you want to get a square wave out of it. How do I do it? Now, one way is to use a comparator, maybe an op amp and so on and you see that the moment you talk about an op amp, you are talking about more complication power supply and so on. Now, this is something you can achieve easily using diodes or synodiodes. So, wave shaping circuits uh, have a kind of family of circuits where you would use the property of a diode and uh, you would combine them with kind of your applications. Uh, 
Now, before we look at some simple wave shaping circuits, let us look at diode models. Now, there are different diode models exist, all of them uh, assume diode to be an open circuit for reverse bias. Now, they all differ in the way the forward bias region is uh, modeled. Now, we have one model which is called the exponential model, which is a very accurate model, which essentially uses the diode equation. Now, there are applications where you might like to uh, determine the diode current very accurately. For example, one such circuit is shown here. Now, if you connect a power supply and a resistor, a series resistor and connect a diode. Now, how do I find out I d and V d? Unfortunately, we can write only one equation here and there are two unknowns. I d and V d are both unknowns, but you have, can write only one equation here. Now, this is a scenario where we can solve this in two ways. Either you can solve it graphically or we can solve this iteratively. Now, the exponential model uh, would solve this either in graphical way or iteratively. Now, it is very easy to solve it iteratively and uh, we would get very accurate results. For example, in the previous circuit, we can write an equation, we can write the equation for the current through the diode as uh, I d is equal to I s times e to the power V d by V t, where V d is the uh, voltage across it, the forward bias voltage across it, V t is the thermal voltage. And uh, from the same circuit also, applying K V L, Kirchhoff's voltage law, we can write current V d as V b, which is the, the input voltage minus diode voltage by resistance. Now, we could solve this iteratively. Let us just take an example and see how quickly we get the result. Now, initially, let us assume that the battery which is given to you, power supply given to us has 5 volts, resistance is 1 k and I s is 10 power minus 12 amps and V t is 25 millivolt. Now, we wrote the first equation, where we wrote the equation for the diode current. From there, we can write the equation for V d, the diode voltage as V t l n I d by I s. Now, initially you could assume V d to be 0, that would give the maximum current to the circuit. So, that current I d can be V b by R 1, which is 5 milliamps. Now, you could substitute that back into the equation for V d. So, V d will be then V t l n 5 milliamps by I s, this will give you 558.3. Now, let us see how quickly the, uh, the uh, the equations converge and that shows the beauty of this method. In the sec second iteration, you could this use this particular voltage as the diode voltage, recalculate, find I d again as V b minus V d, in this V d substitute 0.5583 and if you do that, you get the current to be 4.44. Earlier, the current was 5 milliamps, now it has become 4.44. Now, you recalculate in find V d, you would get V d to be 555.4. You see how close it is to the previous result. Now, do the third iteration. Interestingly, the third, the third iteration gives the same value, which means in just two iterations, you got the exact value. This method is uh, quite accurate, but unfortunately, it is not very useful in a diode circuit, because most of the time, you are not, you, are, you, do, you do not want to get this, this much accuracy. You are interested in a reasonably accurate model but what one which makes the, the analysis faster. Now, this is where we have uh, about three models. The commonly used diode models are piecewise linear model, which is has fairly good accuracy and that is the model which is used most commonly. Now, in the experiment which you will be doing today afternoon, you would be using this, the handouts which are given to you gives you very detailed analysis of the circuit. Now, in the piecewise linear model, you, what you assume is, you assume a linear, you assume linear I v characteristics. We know that the I v characteristics is exponential, but here you would make a, 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 an approximation, you assume it to be linear and you would see 
see that the if you choose a proper uh, value for the resistance, the approximation you would see that is fairly accurate. So, you can think of here the exponential curve is approximated by two straight lines, one which is before the, the threshold point with a slope 0 and the second line with a slope of 1 by R d, where R d would be the diode forward resistance. So, the piecewise linear model equations would be when I d is equal to 0, uh, V d. So, that is the situation where V d is less than V d 0, which is the threshold voltage or the voltage which you consider beyond which you consider it to be uh, conducting. And I d will be V d minus V d 0 by R d provided your V d is greater than V d 0. So, you have these two equation for these two lines. Now, for signal diodes which you typically use in the lab, the V d 0 is typically 0.7 volts and R d would be somewhere between 10 to 20 ohms. Now, remember the these values would change drastically depending on what type of diode you use. If you use a diode like I n 4001, which is a rectifier diode, you would see that this resistance value would be much smaller. The reason is uh, I n 4001 has a rating of 1 amp and 1000 volts P i V. So, therefore, it is meant for that kind of an application. Therefore, you would see that the resistance is very small, but a signal diodes which you are meant for applications up to several higher frequencies, you can up to use it up to almost up to about 1 megahertz. Whereas, these I n 4001, you cannot use beyond let us say about 1 kilohertz, they have very large capacitance. So, the forward voltage which you would get for an I n 4001 would be very different from the parameters you would get for a signal diode. Now, what we have here is a a quick simulation or a quick uh, graphical way of showing how accurate the piecewise linear model is. And you see that the white curve here gives you the diode equation assuming I s to be 10 power minus 15 amps and the other one you have uh, 0 0.7 volts as the forward drop and beyond up to 0 0.4, 0 0.7 volts you have a, a, a line with the slope 0, no current and beyond that you have a line with a slope 1 by R d, where your R d is 10 ohms. And you see that this particular model is fairly accurate. So, it all depends on the point you choose and also the value of the resistance you use. Now, in a lab, once you are able to get this I v characteristics, you could choose two currents so, you could choose two currents on the y axis and find if you expand the your CRO and make a, a proper reading, you could get you know the difference in the diode voltage there and from that you can get a fairly good estimate of R d. That is how you would measure if you want to model it properly that is how you do in the lab. Now, you have another model which is called the constant voltage drop model. Here, you would assume that the diode is essentially an ideal diode. So, you would assume that in the forward region, once it, once it conducts, you would assume that it has a constant voltage drop of 0.7 volts and uh, there is no series resistance. Now, this is a popular model from the point of view of analysis, because this makes analysis much simpler. If you have the previous model, which is the piecewise linear model, then it might you, it might require a few computations, whereas this is much simpler. Let us have a look at how accurate or how this particular uh, model would compare with the actual scenario. So, if you compare the constant voltage drop model with the actual scenario, you would get something like this. So, here you see that this is a very uh, let us say crude approximation and uh, still in spite of that it is still used for the sake of convenience. You also have another model which is called the ideal diode model, where you would assume that when the diode is forward biased, you will assume that 
the forward drop is 0 and uh, the diode is also assumed to have 0 resistance. Now, this is used in circuits let us especially let us say when you talk about a rectifier circuit, you would uh, generally ignore the diode drop. The reason the argument there is that in a rectifier kind of application, the input voltage is much higher than this 0.6 or 0.7. So, there, there uh, it is well justified. So, all these four models are used depending on the kind of application we have in mind. Let us look at, let us try to apply this particular uh, some of these models here. Now, what we have here is basically we are using a uh, ideal diode model here. We have a clipping circuit. So, essentially we are applying a 12 sin omega t as the input here. We have a 1 k series and uh, you have a diode here where we want to assume this diode to be ideal and you have a, a power supply connected in series with the diode here with 3 volt and uh, you have the positive terminal here, negative terminal here. You have a 3 k resistance of the load. Now, how do we go about this? Now, in such a circuit what we generally do is to see the scenario where the uh, diode you split that into at least two scenarios. One scenario where the diode conducts, other scenario where the diode does not conduct and then arrive at it. So, we know that the way the diode is conducted, we know that for V s positive, we know that diode cannot conduct. Now, uh, so therefore, the output would be in this particular case would be uh, 0.75 V s. Now, once you make V s negative, because of that we can see we can apply K V L and uh, uh, we can write uh, the current there as I we can we can apply K V L here. So, the current moving towards the node is I and I 1 and you have I 2 leaving the node here. So, we can write I as I 2 minus I 1 and uh, you could for when the diode is conducting I would be greater than 0. From that you could uh, simplify and uh, you would see that the only when diode voltage rather the input signal is less than minus 4 volts the diode conduct. So, in summary we would have uh, in this particular case using the ideal voltage uh, ideal diode model V out will be minus 3 volt provided V s is less than minus 4 volts that is the situation when D is on and it will be 0 0.75 V s when V s is I am sorry here this should be greater greater than minus 4 volts. Now, the scenario here is uh, simulated here. So, the white waveform here is the input here and the red graph here is the output. Now, the you see here that the 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 output voltage here you can see it is uh, uh, clipped and uh, you have a flat line. If you perform this experiment in the lab, you would see that you never get such a flat line. You might get it depending on the value of resistance is used, but uh, for most of the values you would use, you would see that you this would be a kind of uh, you, you would see a, a the a small variation of the sign here. This you can get if you if you use the piecewise linear model which is given in your handout. So, if you do that you you you, you would be able to get a fairly accurate uh, estimation of what you are actually going to see. Now, again synodides we have been already discussed here we will look for look at synodides from the point of view of uh, their use in clipping circuits. Now, as we know synodides are uh, reference voltage regulators. Now, you could use them uh, especially there are if you want to get uh, 
Now, if you use a synodiod kind of a, a back to back like this and if your input is sin, assume that let us have a 10 sin omega t here and we assume these to be 6 volt sinners and if you assume the diode drop, the forward diode drop to be about let us say 0 0.6 volts, then what you would get at the output would be a kind of a clipped sine wave with a, a plus 6.6 .6 and a minus 6.6. .6. Now, in most applications, uh, this kind of a square wave would be sufficient. In case we want only positive side, we could just use one of them. Now, coming to another, uh, the other applications. Another popular application of a diode is what is called a clamping circuit. Here, you would use a diode in series, a diode and a capacitor in series. Now, the circuit which is shown here, we have an input as V m sin omega t, we have a capacitor here and a diode here. Now, the way the diode is connected, we know that it will permit only current to flow only in the direction from the top to bottom. Now, what will happen is, as the current flows through the diode, the diode that will charge the capacitor with the result that the capacitor would get charged to the maximum voltage of the input. So, in this case, the input is V m sin omega t, therefore, the capacitor will get charged to V m. Now, what happens is, at the output side, now, since we have V m here with positive here, negative here and the polarity of the capacitor voltage is positive this side and minus here, you see that the output here would be nothing but V m sin omega t minus V m. Therefore, we would see that the output would be shifted to the negative side and uh, another way of arguing is this way you see that the way the diode is connected here, we know that this output cannot be positive. So, in one sense we can think of this circuit adjusting itself such a way that the uh, diode charges this capacitor and uh, the output never becoming positive. Now, clamping if you connect the diode the other way, we would have a scenario where the, the capacitor gets charged the other in the other polarity and the waveform getting shifted up. Now, these are very useful circuits. These kind of circuits are very commonly used in what are called uh, DC restoration circuits, where you could restore the DC level. There are other applications such, are, such as voltage doublers, where you can use a clamping circuit and a rectifier circuit together. Now, in this case, what we have here is the same circuit where we have the uh, diode connected in this fashion. So, with the result that the, the, the capacitor gets charged in this fashion and we said that the voltage here would be negative, will be negative and what we have here is basically a, a rectifier, a, a half a rectifier and uh, this will conduct only in this direction. So, the output uh, the polarity shown here is, is wrong here. So, you will have a, a minus 2 V m here. So, this circuits are very, very useful especially voltage double circuits are used in oscilloscopes and also in uh, television sets where you need to have very large voltages especially the plate voltage in a CRO or in a television requires voltage of the order of 10,000. So, their voltage doublers are very useful. Uh, this circuit, the, the moment you put a resistor, you would see that the voltages slightly change and in the in, in most of the voltage doublers applications, the current drawn would be very, very small. Now, uh, 
we could spend little time on uh, simple rectifier circuits, especially uh, the use of a capacitor in a rectifier. Now, rectifier circuit If you consider a half way rectifier, and if you have a load here, and if the input is V m sin omega t, now if we did not have the resistor there, then the capacitor would have if uh, the input was this. Now, if you did not have the, the, the resistor there, then the capacitor would have got charged to the full V m here. At the moment we put a capacitor, capacitor here the, and the resistor here, both charging and discharging takes place. Now, one of this is this is one of the common circuits used to get a DC voltage, and uh, one of the common misconception uh, is is the method to reduce the ripple voltage. Now, in this scenario, in this case, what happens is the capacitor would charge, and because of the resistor, it would discharge, and uh, during the next uh, positive half cycle, it will charge and so on. Now very often it is thought that we know that the ripple, the peak to peak ripple here can be decreased by increasing the value for a given R L. If, if, if we for a given R L, we can decrease the ripple by increasing the capacitor. So, that is very commonly thought as a, a way of reducing the ripple. But uh, one very important thing to remember, thing to remember, is the not only the voltage, at the output, but also the diode current. Now the diode in this particular case, in the circuit shown here, the diode can conduct only for a extremely short period. Now, the entire uh, charge or the entire voltage and the entire the, discharge, the charge which was discharged through the resistance has to be picked up through the small interval through which it is charged, the charging period. Now, if you increase the value of the capacitor, this time period will keep reducing. The ripple will definitely decrease, it will become much smaller, but the same way the the peak current would keep increasing. Very often, there are situations where a diode, maybe an IN 4001, which is used for an application like say 100 milliamps, you all of a sudden find that the diode has packed up, diode has burnt, and one really wonders why it burnt. And the answer is, if we look at, if you put a small series resistance and try to monitor the diode current, we would see that the peak diode current is most of the time about at least 10 times the current that is flowing through the average, the average current flowing. So, this is something which is to be kept in mind very often. So, in a power supply therefore, the solution is to reduce ripple, the solution is not to uh, put a large capacitor, rather to put a, a some reasonable value like 1000 microfarad or so, the solution is to use voltage regulators. Now, uh, to give a small recap of what we did uh, in this particular lecture, let me just spend another 5 minutes quickly to recap what we did. We talked about uh, special uh, devices, we talked about varactors, we talked about uh, them being used as 
kind of voltage controlled kind of capacitors. We said that they are very useful uh, in not only appliances and a radio, especially in fine tune and today we would find this very often. And the principle there is that of a p n junction, a reverse bias p n junction, which uh, the capacitance changes with the reverse bias voltage. Then we talked about the light emitting diodes. We said that they are again p n junctions, but these p n junctions are made of special semiconductors which are called direct pan gap semiconductors and the crystalline silicon, uh, silicon which we are familiar with, the silicon is not a direct semiconductor, uh, band gap semiconductor. And there are materials like gallium arsenide, aluminum galsonide and many such materials. If you make a p n junction out of these materials, then when you pass, when you forward bias this particular diode, you would see that they emit light. And uh, this, this kind of uh, uh, the phenomena is what is called radiative recombination. And uh, we said that in some of these semiconductors, you can change the band gap by changing the mole fraction, because most of them uh, belong to uh, like especially the ternary like aluminum, gallium arsenide or even quaternary. There by changing the mole fraction, you can change the band gap thereby you can change the, the lambda of the light emission. We also talked about uh, laser diodes, where we said the process uh, is what is called stimulated emission, where the light which is emitted is coherent both spatially and temporally. And uh, they to achieve population inversion, they use special structures which are called heterostructures, which are made of different materials with slightly different band gap, but matched. And uh, we said that LEDs are very commonly used even in uh, communication, especially in small LAN applications. But laser diodes are the devices of choice, especially in optical fiber communication. And uh, today in our country, all over the country, optical fibers are used as the backbone for all communication. And then we talked about photo detectors, which we said are nothing but p n junctions, which are reverse biased and also the where the junction is exposed to light. And uh, you would generally find uh, photo detectors with kind of a, a quartz window. And uh, they have what are called dark current, which is nothing but the reverse saturation current. And uh, also have what is called a photo current, which is the current uh, caused by light. And the photo current we said is directly proportional to the light falling on it. And we talked about another interesting device, which we could even make it in a lab easily, which is what is called an optocoupler, which is made out of LED and a photo detector, which we said can be used to couple light, uh, sorry, couple a signal from one system to another system. When you talk about system, we are talking about maybe major equipment, maybe taking a signal from a very big equipment to a PC. In some kind of scenario, we cannot directly take because the grounds may be a different potential and this optocoupler is one such is a device which helps us in such a uh, situation to achieve electrical isolation. We also talked about uh, uh, different diode models. We talked about uh, the exponential model which we said is a very accurate model and is very useful if you have a simple circuit and you want to uh, find out the exact voltage and diode voltage and diode current. But we said unfortunately, it is not very easy to use. And uh, we talked about three more models. We said the piecewise linear model, where we assume a linear IB characteristics. And uh, we said this particular model is an extremely accurate model. And uh, we, when we fitted this with an actual characteristics, we found that the the fitting was uh, very good. And we also said occasionally we would use a volt constant voltage drop model uh, to make uh, our hand calculation simpler. And occasionally we might also use ideal diode model, especially in rectifier circuits. And then we talked about 
clipping circuits. We also talked about uh, both synodiodes also being used in clipping circuits. We finally, talked about clamping circuits and uh, voltage doublers. So, I would uh, stop my lecture here.